October 1999, I was there, met this amazing guy, Brian Adams and David Bowie, as well as a few others. Earlier that day, when we first arrived there at like, I don't know, 6, 7 a.m. These are photographs that I took with my Kodak throwaway camera. So you can see clearly. <laughs> oh my god, there's me. Doing some crazy stuff. Backstage. The, just before or just after people were on stage, they'd come out and do their sort of interviews. Yeah, so this is pre-show. These computers obviously had um, the internet. So they were logged on. It's places for people to sit and eat. There are a couple of bars, this is one of them. Some of the team. Of course we had a much, much bigger team than that, but it was just some of the initial photos. I've seen a lot of posts where people are saying how awful 2016 have been and, and I guess to a certain extent that's true. Quite a few legends have passed away this year. Just to put it into context, in those years I was working for Hard Rock Cafe. Those of you who know, who've known me for a while know that um, my first ever proper job was working at Hard Rock Cafe in London. I don't know if they still do that now, um, but in those days um, they pretty much did all the backstage, you know, the catering, the entertainment and uh, sort of various other things. Um, for a lot of the sort of big massive concerts whenever there was things like European MTV Awards um, the Brit Awards this particular event was a unique one-off it was basically supposed to be uh, Live Aid the famous Live Aid um, part two uh, from the 1980s um, so it wasn't just um, David Bowie, uh, Brian Adams and George Michael um, we had Robbie Williams, we had uh, The Cause, Bush, um, Eurythmics and in fact London was one of three cities that um, were holding concerts so we had the Geneva concert that kicked it all off first um, but the main bulk of all the superstars were in then London and then as London was finishing the one in America was starting um, and the whole thing was obviously this was around about the time when the internet was exploding so this was going to be I think one of the first major events, international events, uh, that was being broadcast over the internet and that's why it's called NetAid. Do look it online, if you type in NetAid 1999 you'll get all the details on. It wasn't just the people that were performing, there was a lot of you know kind of stars, movie stars, uh, celebrities that turn up who were kind of introducing the people performing in between each artist and you know there was people, there was um, Jamie Theakston and I think Gail, uh, is it Gail Porter? Um, who are interviewing all the stars in between. We basically turned up sort of <laughs> at the crack of dawn, sort of like 6, 7 a.m. and we had literally till about 4 p.m. to set up everything, have it ready, and I think it was kicking off around about 4 p.m. and it was going on till like sort of, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, like most concerts do. I wasn't there as a, anything particular because I was a manager. I kind of did a bit of everything. Um, and also to make sure that everybody was looked after. I was one of the managers for the retail shop and Hard Rock always give away, um, you know, lots of free merchandise because um, it's fantastic advertisement for them when obviously any of these celebrities, you know, get snapped wearing one of their t-shirts or jackets or, you know, caps or whatever. And that night I got to meet a ridiculous um, number of people. Um, but the three that sticks out the most are David Bowie, Brian Adams and especially George Michael. At that point, 1999, I've been in England for about 10, 11 years. Um, and pretty much, um, I think in my previous vlogs, you know, kind of the things that I went through when I was at like, when, I, when, when we first arrived here, when I was at secondary school, you know, with the bullying and the, you know, being picked on all the time. Within my kind of family and friend kind of bubble, um, I was still this kind of quite happy, quite uh, sociable, um, 
you know, a lot of people found me quite funny, witty. Um, I was doing my impressions. I always did my joking. So I was a fairly outgoing, very kind of larger than life character still. Um, but when every, but when I kind of tended to step outside of that, um, I was a lot more reserved and quiet and shy. And at that stage, I was only like 20, 19, 20 years old, something like that. And when I think back, um, like a lot of things changed for me from that night onwards. And I must admit, it, I, I was quite, you know, nervous. I was quite, um, uh, you know, it's quite intimidating. You know, you got, sur you're surrounded by like, you know, we had Catherine Zeta-Jones there. We had Michael Douglas there. Just the caliber of all the superstars that were there to perform was just incredible. Half of them were kind of my heroes anyway. The people that I kind of listened to, I'd been listening to for a while. But above all, it was really David Bowie, Brian Adams, and especially George Michael that had this huge impact on me that evening. Um, so David Bowie was there with his wife, Iman, the supermodel. Um, Brian Adams was there with his crew. Um, and George Michael arrived with his partner, then partner, Kenny Goss, and Jerry Halliwell of Spice Girls fame. Them three kind of came together as a, like a mini group, um, and they pretty much stuck together all evening, although, you know, they were kind of off and again mingling and talking to people in between. So let me just pause for one second, because um, I think just to put this thing into context, further context, I'm just gonna quickly rewind back to my childhood. Those, especially those first 10 years when I was in Turkey, there was one artist that I listened to like nonstop, one artist that I grew up on. And that one artist is not George Michael. <laughs> you thought I was gonna say George Michael. Um, no, it's actually Michael Jackson. I mean, come on. You know, if you're, if you're a kid in the 80s, there's only one artist you loved and you kind of listened to and followed. However, however, saying that, the one other artist that I did listen to was George Michael. Um, and the reason for that were two, no, three songs. Wake Me Up Before You Go Go, Faith, and Careless Whisper, especially in the mid 80s. It was just a huge hit in Turkey where I was. Faith and Wake Me Up is just, you know, such a fun song. And, you know, considering the fact that I was, you know, sort of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, um, it was just such, those two songs were just such fun songs. I also had a childhood sweetheart in Turkey, this girl that I was madly in love with. Um, God, I hope she's not watching this. And it's somebody that actually I, I know since we were literally babies. In fact, probably my very first friend ever. And we were neighbors um, when literally I was like two, three years old, you know, crawling or running around. Um, and our mums were very good friends. So I think they lived, uh, they lived just below us. Eventually we went to junior school together. For, I don't, I don't know why, whenever I hear Careless Whisper, it just takes me back to those days um, and the heartbreak of moving to London and leaving all of my you know, closest friends and, and that lady. When we came to England, and I listened to more and more of George Michael's other songs, that whole romantic theme kind of continued because the first time I ever kissed a girl was to a George Michael song. George Michael was my go-to artist whenever I wanted to kind of set a romantic mood. The first time I got my heart broken, my kind of heartbreak song that I listened to um, was A Different Corner. To me, still to this day, it's a beautiful, beautiful song. My mum absolutely loved George Michael's music as well. So there was that one thing that always connected me and my mum, that there was one thing that we could both listen to and enjoy. My mum particularly liked Jesus to a Child and um, another song called um, You Have Been Loved. I think he lost his mother in 1996 or 97 thereabouts. And I think that song, again, I cannot listen to that song even today without my eyes welling up. Also just takes me back to that very specific period in my life. It's around about 1997, Princess Diana died. Shock to everyone. A lot of the London radio, like Capital FM, were continuously playing You Have Been Loved. Mum both loved that and we were obviously both very sad about Diana dying. Those two songs have a very special place in my heart even today. Whenever I hear those songs, I think of my mum, I think of that those particular years, grown up with his music, and it, it has a very special place in my heart. 1999 and this event came, it's George Michael. Through my interaction with those particular three guys, I relaxed, I found myself relaxed very, very quickly. I have to single them out because um, time and time again, um, David Bowie, would come up to me and chat to me um, because very quickly I'd already known, um, sorry, there's a there's another bit of trivia for you. David
David Bowie went to the same secondary school that I did in Bromley called Ravenswood School for Boys and I already knew that. A couple of times he came up to me and asked me a couple of questions or he asked for some stuff and then through that we got chatting. Um, and then I said to him, well, by the way, um, I know that you went to Ravenswood. That's where I went. And he goes, oh, really? And that was it. You know, once I, t I told him that, he just really opened up to me and we were having all these brilliant conversations. So, you know, he's telling me stories about Ravenswood and um, some very funny stuff. He owned an IP company, so he had uh, Bowie.net. He's telling me about where he thought the internet and online was going. I mean, these were, I mean, the internet was fairly still in its early stages at that point. And Brian Adams, again, I was really, really into Brian Adams. We got chatting, he was doing his set. Um, him and his whole crew, um, they were all wearing white completely white um, and literally he just finished his set and he was coming back upstairs through these staircases when just at that point by total coincidence I was kind of going downstairs with this extremely extremely heavy and full up um, bus dish bus you know uh, like a bus bucket dirty dishes and glasses and all that kind of stuff and literally I turned around and he came up right in front of me and nearly the whole thing went all over him. I nearly covered him and his guitarist and a couple of his other guys. <laughs> Luckily it didn't happen, I just about managed to hold on to it. Um, and he even went, whoa, and kind of hold out his arms. And later on, um, again, we joked about it and I said, oh, I'm really sorry, I nearly got you. And he goes, ah, it's fine. He goes, you know, nothing happened. Being such a fan of Brian Adams, I knew that only a few years before, um, he'd released a song called um, Do I Have To Say The Words? And the video to that he shot in Istanbul. So I said, oh, by the way, you know, were you actually really in Istanbul? Or is that all? He said, no, no, yeah, I went. And he, you know, once he kind of found out that I was Turkish, um, you know, he was, you know, we were talking about Turkey, about Istanbul. Um, he was saying that how much he loved the place and he, he was planning to go back again and do some concert. Really, really fantastic guy so down to earth then we come to george michael um and god what can i say about george michael um again i introduced myself and uh you know we kind of hit it off really quickly i mean immediately you know when i said my name oh where is that from is that is that turkish and i think i'm pretty sure he guessed that it was a turkish name which is quite rare because it's a name that isn't that regular in turkey either so i was really impressed i was like but then obviously he's got greek roots etc um, and he goes, yeah, and then I said, um, yes, I'm Turkish. And he said, oh, fantastic. And he was telling me that he's got a few Turkish friends. But again, I was a bit, you know, kind of a bit sheepish, a bit kind of. Um, and I think he sensed that. So he was just being really friendly and just um, really cool. Him and actually both him and Kenny Goss were just really wonderful, wonderful guys. Just so down to earth. No, none of this kind of arrogant kind of I'm better than everyone attitude that you can you unfortunately sometimes see today um i have to say that several times kind of mingling and when he was on his way back tapped me on the shoulder and say hey how's it going you'll talk to me about you know how busy it was and ask me a couple of other specific stuff so he goes do you do you like you know any of my songs at that point we'd already had a few conversations so i felt actually i felt very comfortable talking to him all of those guys um that's the thing, they're just, they've got, they're so warm, they're so sincere, they're so um, just ordinary. It's like, um, it's like as if you're their best friend or you've been their friend for years and they're just talking to their friend and they're just so, it's just something about them that they, there's a lot of humility, there's a lot of humbleness um, in the way that they talk to people, the way they treat people and how, how they are. And that's the one thing that I have to say, especially those three people, and they're amongst some other massive, massive, you know, names and people. That's something that really s stuck with me, even to this day. We sort of had a bit of a rapport. He knew my name. He was kind of calling me by my name. He said, oh, so do you like my music? And I said, well, are you kidding? Um, you know, me and my mum absolutely, you know, love you. And, I, and then, uh, you know, I said, I pretty much grew up with your music. So we're having this conversation as we're walking back to Kenny um, and we would pretty much arrived by that point and um, so he kind of just sat down and then kind of just lounged back on the sofa and he's kind of looking up at me quickly gave him a rundown of the particular songs that I really liked or you know that had some kind of sort of sentimental um, attachment to for for particular periods in my life he, he was just really loving it I could see you know in his eyes that um, he asked about my mum I told him a little bit about my mum and then I have no idea what gave me the balls to to actually divulge this information. Mum, if you're listening, cover your ears. As much as all of those songs really mean a lot to me, I would have to say definitely up there, there's two very particular songs that I probably, you know, um, will like for 
you know, forever. And he said, well, really, which ones? And I said, well, spinning the wheel and fast love. And he goes, oh, well, I'm going to be doing fast love. He said, well, why do you, you know, why do you say that? Probably because, you know, I, um, pop my cherry to both those songs and he just kind of let out this big his face just and he just let out this big screaming laughter both him and Kenny actually he goes really are you serious and I was like yeah and I said I remember it because it wasn't you know planned thing just kind of chilling out um, at her place she was also a big fan of yours and we both like listened to the older album and I said I just remember putting the older album and putting it on shuffle um, and then spinning the wheel came on knows it's got this really cool jazzy kind of vibe then we started kissing and then one thing led to another and by the end of the song we're at it just by coincidence the next song that came on was fast love and he just again he was he was loving the story i mean in fact i remember it so well because i said he was kind of lounging back and as i was telling the story he just kind of kind of like set up and he kind of came to the edge of his seat and both him and kenny are just looking at me like you know, just loving the story. And I said, I'm very happy to report that unlike the sto song title, it wasn't such a fast love and he just, they both just screamed the house down with laughter. Then he just turned to Kenny and he goes, I love this guy. And just looked at me and said, darling, you're in the wrong business. You're in the wrong job. You should be like in comedy or so he goes, something you were born to entertain people. And he goes, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be singing that song, Fast Love. And I said, yeah, I know I'm going to be out there dancing. Every couple of hours, we're allowed to have like a 10, 15 minute break. And if we wanted to go and watch some of the acts, we could just, you know, go in our passes. There's mine. Yeah, look at this thing. God, I still have this. I can't believe it. Yep. There is my car. <laughs> and you see this thing? This is a pin, right? This is the president's pin. These are ridiculously rare staff only pins that, um, and yeah, there's my manager's card, my Micros manager's card. Uh,. Wow. Anyway, um, so yeah, so I had this on. I went out for one David Bowie song, a couple of the um, Brian Adams sets, and the pretty much the full set for George. Uh, the effects were immediate because um, once it all finished and everybody had gone, um, we then had to do a massive clear up, which take which took quite a few hours. Um, so I think we were finished like sort of two, three in the morning. At that time, I was single, um, but there were a couple of you know, girls that worked. Uh, one of them worked in the corporate office over the road. Uh, one of them was somebody that worked in the restaurant. I mean, I'd already had a couple of girlfriends by that point. As I divulged to George, I'd already um, popped my cherry by that point a few years before. Um, so I had had girlfriends, so I wasn't like completely, but I still, I did not have the confidence to be able to just, if I liked a girl, to just go up to her and ask her out. It took a lot for me to kind of build up to that confidence level. And the thing is, there's a lot of things after that that I, I went through and there were points in my life where again, I kind of lost my confidence a little bit, I guess lost my way a little bit. And I would say probably in the last sort of three, four years, I found it again. I have to say, I think looking back to such early period of my life, um, I was literally at the start of kind of starting out into the real world. And I think if I didn't have that experience and if I if they hadn't been that way with me that evening, I would have to say that um, sort of the way I've, my characters developed and the way things have gone for me, they have a hand in it, especially George Michael has a big hand in that. So I will be forever. I mean, I never got a chance to meet him again um, after that. So that was the one night, the one time I ever met him. Um, but his, that, the impact that he had on me that night will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, and there's certain things that I would have to thank him for um, that I could, I would have never been, or I probably would have never developed if it hadn't been to him and the kind of the confidence that him and also David Bowie and Brian Adams kind of gave to me that evening with the way they were with me. You know, these, these were, I mean, they were all colossal in their own way. Was, there was lots of other stars and some of them were very much, you know, they, they just kind of be left alone. They didn't really want to talk to anybody apart from the people that they wanted to talk to. It wasn't like sort of following them around. Um, I was kind of going around really trying to do a good job of my responsibilities. And these people just kept coming and seeking me out and, and wanting to actually have just an, they weren't, uh, and they weren't seeking me out to like ask for something. They were seeking me out to have a conversation with me again or continue the conversation that we were having maybe half an hour ago. Um, 
and afterwards when I thought about it that had a very profound effect on me that really kind of then brought me out of my shell in a way and as I said that I mean there's actually look I've got some more photos oh sorry so that's Eddie Jordan by the way those of you who are into Formula One will know who that means I thought well I may never get a chance like this again you could buy these throw away one time only Kodak uh, cameras that were like kind of made out of cardboard but they had literally the film strip in it so I've got myself one of those I'll have that on me just in case I get opportunities so and, and sort of in between I managed to kind of sneak in a few photos and saying that there's the there is Mr. David Bowie um, just I think this is just as he was just coming off stage he just performed and he was coming off stage and closely followed by his wife Iman who, who was being interviewed as he was coming back ah, those are the guys because when I was right up close I couldn't take any pictures but as I was kind of I decided to go a little bit further back and take some photos from the back to get the whole stage everybody once it was all finished we did a big clean up um, and then just as we were finishing um, the general manager said right all the drinks that are left it's a free-for-all help yourselves have a drink you've all deserved it so we all got very very drunk afterwards um, and then they had professional photographers there who took this fantastic photo and there is yours truly me <laughs> And um, just a couple of significant things. That's Lisa Rice, our general manager at the time. And there is the famous Rita. Now, Rita is famous because she is one of the very first waitresses at Hard Rock Cafe. Um, the London Hard Rock Cafe um, opened in the 70s. And it, I don't know if you knew this, but um, it was the very first Hard Rock Cafe in the world. Um, it was opened by two Americans in the 70s who lived in London at the time. Um, there weren't really anywhere they can get some decent American food. So they decided to open their own. And she's famous across all the Hard Rocks and all the Hard Rock Cafe fans. She's one of the first waitresses um, and she goes everywhere now. She's like a superstar in her own right. This, this is, um, I got them to take one with my camera. And that's the, uh, the one of the two that I had a bit of a crush on. However, as I was saying, um, look at that. I mean, seriously, look at look at this. Look at this crazy mental guy. Um, me and my angels. Yeah, I mean, I look at these photos and gosh, oh my God, there you go. And this was, I think, a couple of days after. Again, these are all hard rock colleagues that I work with. Um, and this was at a... <laughs> I remember this actually. This was like a salsa club in Leicester Square. Um, that's not there anymore. Um, yeah, so there's my kind of George Michael story. And I will be forever grateful because those kind of... The following kind of couple of years were probably the best years of my life. And I say that because I was young. It was my first proper job. And after this, um, I kind of went on to really do well at Hard Rock. That pin there, as I said, that's the president's pin, right? Now, I won about three of these. Um, and I know this is like a silly little pin. I know it doesn't look like anything much. Um, but in Hard Rock Cafe, this is like gold. Um, somebody actually, I think um, somebody offered me, anyway, like two, three hundred pounds just for this little pin here because um, there are a lot of collectors around the world who love collecting rare Hard Rock Cafe pins. Um, it's a big business, or it was back then, a big business. But, um, they don't kind of give those out very all that came about from that night um, it was after that night i really came out of my shell like ever since i was young i was doing impressions i was impersonating around about those years um the austin powers movies by mike myers were at the height of their popularity and of course um i could do austin powers i could do fat bastard i could do dr evil um pretty much all the characters that mike myers embodied i, I kind of became like a, among the tourists, like literally tourists used to come in or people who ate asking for me saying, hey, you know, we hear that you guy, you basically got a Austin Powers guy here. We want to meet him. Where is he? Where is he? And they would go, yep, that's auction. Go around the corner to the, to the shop and you'll find him there. I had people come in who wanted to meet me and speak to me and get me to do my impersonation. So I had to keep coming out every so often and just entertain this massive shop full of tourists. And especially in the summertime, um, if you ever been to Hard Rock Cafe, you'll know this. Um, the queues are literally going outside all the way around the block. Um, that's how popular it gets in the summer with all the tourists, um, literally from all around the world. 
Um, so I had people coming in asking for me, particular, specifically to see me and to talk to me and to get me to do my impressions and stuff. I had people videoing with me, they wanted to take photos with me and all that. It was just crazy. It's, to this day, it's probably the best job I've ever worked in. And it was fantastic. And really, those are the moments when I guess even more so the whole kind of love of performing, um, again, getting into characters, um, entertaining, um, just were sown. Fast forward three, four, five years down the line from that, my life kind of went into a completely different direction um, that I never really planned to. But that's a whole different conversation. But probably best that I end this vlog here. Watch the next vlog. It's going to come very quickly after this one. And I'm going to kind of do a summation of 2016 and 2017. If you want a bit of motivation, definitely watch the next one.